Kia ora, Kiwi Kaji here and welcome to episode 59. This episode isn't part of the Musket Wars which I'm leaving for a while as I need to travel uh, to some areas which I won't be doing uh, until September. This episode is entitled New Zealand's First Hanging, Part 1. In this episode we'll set the scene and explore the crime that led to it. My references for this episode is this book, Motu Arohia, by Morris Leonard, and articles from Papers Past. Links are in the description below. The crime occurs in the Bay of Islands on Motu Arohia. It's located here. This island has been sold by the chiefs Rewa, Warairahi, and Moko to Captain John Roberton in 1839. Captain Roberton has given up whaling to become a farmer on Motu Arohia. He is in his early 40s. His wife, Elizabeth, is four years older than him. They have a son, Gordon, who is seven, and a newborn daughter, Askina. Captain Robinson builds a house there and moves his family onto the island. In November 1840, he has a new boat, which he is testing just off the island in the bay. In spite of his experience, the boat gets into trouble and he drowns. The boat, an almost total loss. What a tragedy for his wife, Elizabeth who was left with an unfinished and partially paid-for house and money still owing on the wrecked boat. Because the farm is still young, there is little to sell. Elizabeth doesn't have clear title to the island, as all land sales prior to the Treaty of Waitangi need to be adjudicated by the land courts. Adding to her woes, Governor Hobson moves the capital to Auckland in late 1840. Māori in the bay are also not happy with this move, as many Europeans in the bay leave for Auckland. So the once thriving Bay of Islands economy is now taking a hit. Elizabeth has little choice but to carry on farming. She hires a young man, Thomas Bull, as a farm manager. He's in his 30s. And a young Maori lad, Makatu. He is the son of Ruhe, a chief from the Ahuahu area. She also takes Isabel Brind into her family. Isabella, now three, is the offspring of Captain Brine and Maui Waka, the daughter of Rewa. After the deaths of Hongihika and Titore, Rewa is now the paramount chief of the Bay of Islands. It's thought that uh, Moe Waka may have passed away, which is why Isabella is with the Robertons on the island. In mid-November 1841, the next year, Elizabeth Robertson is granted title to Motu Arohia after Rewa and Warairahi testify in the Bay of Islands Land Court to the sale of the island. After a hellish year since her husband's death, things are finally looking up for Elizabeth. It is around 6.30pm Saturday, 20th of November, 1841. People in Paroa Bay see a languid plume of dark smoke rising from Motu Arohia, four kilometres away to the north. A party under Captain Barber row out to the island. Soon after arriving, another boat lands with William Bartley. They find the homestead of the Robertons a hot, smouldering ruin. They can make out three charred bodies in the house. Captain Barber's party 
row the eight kilometers to Kororaraka and report their findings to the chief constable before returning to Paroa in the moonlight. The next day, Sunday, Captain Baba and his party returned to Moto Arohia early in the morning and discover the body of Tommy Bull. It's 30 metres from the smouldering house. It's under a blanket and canvas. The body has been tomahawked. It's now obvious that this is no accident scene, but the site of multiple murders. Again, they set off for Kororaraka and report to the chief constable. Word of the murders quickly ripples through Kororaraka and out into the bay. On Monday, Thomas Spicer and William Wilson, res residents of Kororaraka, go to the island. They find four Māori men there who can fight to them who the murderer is. They return and report to the coroner. Mr. Davis, who convenes an inquest team. The team immediately visits the island and get there early afternoon. They observe the scene. The medical officer inspects the bodies. On their return to Kororaraka, they find everyone agitated with wild rumours of a native uprising. Many notable residents give credence to such rumours. The HMS favourite, anchored in the bay, sends a platoon into Kororaraka. Everyone is on edge, but there's no sign of rebellion or evidence of Māori gathering. From the available evidence, it's looking like the act of a solitary perpetrator. It's dawn, Tuesday, the 23rd. After being unable to secure a military force to accompany them, Spicer and Wilson row back to Motu Arohia to arrest the murderer. But coming in sight of the beach, see over 200 excited Māori on the shore. They bravely decide to land. Also there is Makatu, the young 16-year-old who had been the farmhand on the island. He is the one identified as a murderer. Another 120 Māori arrive from the mainland. Spicer and Wilson try to negotiate the arrest of Makatu, but Māori are not having it. Things are becoming quite tense, especially after Ruhe, Makatu's father, arrives. After some negotiations and offer of a reward, plus Māori discussing the situation amongst themselves, it's agreed that Māori will deliver Makatu to Kororaraka tomorrow at the watering place. Spicer and Wilson are thankful to leave the island in one piece and reach Oniro Beach around 10 p.m. By this time, everyone in the bay is aware of who the murderer is. The next day, Wednesday, Reverend Henry Williams leaves Paihia for the island, setting off at dawn. He organises for the burial of the victims and engages in talks with Māori on the island. In the afternoon, Makatu is delivered by his father Ruhe and others to the watering place, where he is given up to Spicer and Wilson, who have gone there to secure him. Ruhe hands over his son on the assurance that Makatu will be safe until the inquiry is over. Now it must be remembered that Māori outnumber European in the bay by at least 15 to 1. In effect, nothing can really be done without Māori consent. After the surrender of Makatu, the coroner's inquest is immediately held. Makatu, 
through the interpreter John King, tells his story. He goes to the island two days before the murders. Tommy Bull and he go off to clean corn. They quarrel, and later Makatu kills him while Tommy is asleep. He comes to the house and tells Elizabeth, who appears to completely mishandle the situation. We will never know. Suffice to say, Makatu retrieves the Cooper's axe, returns to the house and kills her. Then Askina, her 18-month-old daughter, and Isabella, the three-year-old daughter, granddaughter of Rewa. Gordon, her seven-year-old son, has the sense to escape and runs out the back door. Makatu gathers what he wants from the house, then sets it on fire. He tracks Gordon up the route to the old pa where he finds him, beats him, and throws him over the cliff. When questioned, Makatu states that he is unaware that one of the girls he killed is Rewa's granddaughter. The inquest goes into the next day. Makatu is held in the Kororaraka jail. After numerous witnesses, both Māori and Pakiha, the inquest closes. On Sunday morning, the 28th of November, eight days after the murders, Makatu is smuggled on board the government brig Victoria, escorted by Constable Shaw. It sails soon after for Auckland. They arrive around noon the next day. Constable Shaw and a hastily summoned detachment from Fort Britomart escort Makatu to the city jail, which is at the corner of Queen Street and Victoria Street West. News of the arrival of Makatu causes quite a buzz through the fledgling capital. Okay, so you've seen Google Earth's Motu Arohia. Let's have a quick look at drone footage I recorded in early 2019. So this video was taken quite early in the morning, and here we are looking from the west across the island, across the what is called the lagoon there, and over to the uh, ridge on the east. Now, apart from Makatu, uh, this island also is quite famous for Cook, first landing in the Bay of Islands on this island. And him and Banks climbed that uh, large hill you can see at the eastern edge. Now, the grass you can see here is, uh, has obviously been cultivated, but it would have been flax and taken a lot of breaking in. I would imagine they'd run some animals. Certainly, they sound like they've had some corn. Now, the house is down there on the bottom left of the screen, and we're about to fly over the pa, the little area here where uh, dear old Gordon raced to try and save himself, was finally caught by uh, Makatu, and was thrown over the left-hand edge down the cliff face there. His body was never recovered. Um, a very sad end for a little fella. And in the distance, as we pan around here slightly, we'll see the, um, right there is where Kororaraka is just on the other side of that um, peninsula there, and only Roa Beach is just on the left. Now, with Makatu safely ensconced in the Queen Street Jail, you'd think that this first episode is at an end. However, the drama is not over. John Hickey, better known as Hone Hickey, has been away from the Bay of Islands over the period of the murders. On his return to the Bay, he's not happy at the taking of Makatu. He feels this matter should have been sorted by Māori. Of course, the fact that Ray was granddaughter Isabella Bryant has been killed complicates matters. The Māori in the Bay are in a state of turmoil. The memory of the Girls' War, ten years earlier, effectively a civil war between the northern and southern Hapu in the Bay. 
resulted in over 100 Māori dead or wounded. Bad feelings still smoulder beneath the surface. Tāmati Wākānini requests the Reverend Williams to hold a hui at the mission grounds at Paihia for the Ngāpui chiefs to discuss the matter and hopefully come to a consensus before another civil war breaks out. And so he does. A large hui is held at Paihia, and following it, a joint communique is issued on the 16th of December, 1841, signed by the chiefs, including Ruhe, but alas, not Hone Heki, stating that British law should take its course. It's the first major test of the Treaty of Waitangi. If not for the killing of Isabella Brind, the granddaughter of Rewa, then most probably Makatu would have been spirited away by his people to a distant part of the country, far beyond British rule. It would have been interesting if the Hui had decided that Makatu should be returned and dealt with by Māori. What would Hobson have done? Interesting, eh? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. So, with Makatu in the city jail and Napui in agreement for the government to deal with this, we come to the end of this episode. I'd like to thank one of my subscribers, David Herzl, for constructing the 3D models of the Robertons house on Motu, Motu Arohia in its complete and burnt out states. It really added to the telling of this piece of history. In part two, we'll cover the trial, execution and its aftermath. I look forward to your company again, but until then, take it easy. Hey Kona. Catch you later.